high school, senior year in high school, 17 years old, went to a party one night with some friends, and at this party, a big fight broke out. Uh, I engaged in the fight. Three days later, the uh, sheriff down in Florida showed up at my parents' home with a warrant for my arrest. One of the teens that I'd hit during the fight had slipped into a coma. Mm. My father went and turned me in, and I sat in jail for three months my senior year in high school waiting to find out if this young man was going to live or if he was going to die, waiting to find out if they were going to charge me with murder or attempted murder. Uh, I called home after 90 days. My mom answered the phone crying, and uh, she said, son, he came out of the coma. He's going he's gonna to live. He's going to be okay. And it was the best news I'd ever heard in my life. But when I, I travel and speak at the high schools and the middle schools, I always try to impart on our youth that when you make bad choices in life, there are almost always bad consequences that come along with those. And, and for me, those consequences were going to be great. Why 10 years even after he lived? Like, that seems exceptionally harsh to me. Yeah, well, media had gotten a hold of the story. Uh, there had been a lot of that fighting and stuff going on in Tampa at the time, and uh, I became that example. Wow. Yeah. So you ended up in prison, 17 years old. Tell me about those first few days and just trying to figure out, how am I going to survive 10 yeah. years in this place? Yeah. The first year was extremely rough. I got sent to one of the worst prisons in Florida. The gang violence was daily. Riots were weekly. Uh, fought for my life on numerous occasions. Watched people uh, stabbed to death, beat to death right in front of me. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was uh, a whole different world. If I could explain hell on earth, it would be that place I was at. It was pretty rough. Uh, it was about a year into my incarceration. It was lights out time and that steel door slammed shut on that prison cell, sealing me in for the night. And it was so dark I couldn't even see a foot in front of my face. And that particular night, the weight of the world just came crashing in on me all at once. I felt every emotion you could imagine, feelings of hopelessness, helplessness, uh, regret, fear, I was one year into a 10-year sentence. I didn't know how I was going to survive the next nine. And I remember crouching down as these emotions consumed me in the corner of the cell, uh, burying my forehead in my knees and crying, you know, like a little baby. Mm. And for the first time in my life, the thought of suicide actually crossed my mind because as I sat there in the corner of that cell, I felt like my life had no meaning and it had no purpose. And in that moment, I remembered something. My darkest moment of my life contemplating suicide. I remembered something my grandfather had told me when I was 10 years old. My grandfather was a Christian and we used to spend our summers there and he was always imparting these words of wisdom on us, right, when we were growing up. And you know, I was young, I had my own agenda, I wasn't trying to hear any of that, right? But one summer he got my attention and he said, son, he said, just promise me one thing. If you're ever at your darkest moment in life and your back's against the wall and you don't feel like you have any way out, just promise me you'll drop to your knees immediately and cry out for Jesus. Mm. I said, okay, granddaddy, sure. I didn't think about it again until that night in that cell, but I was there, back against the wall, darkest moment of my life, no way out. So I took his advice and I laid my face on that cold, hard, dirty, concrete prison floor and I cried like I've never cried before in my life. And when I called out his name, in an instant, everything changed. So what does that feel like? You know, we talk about this a lot, like, my life changed, but, but what does that mean? Like when you woke up the next morning, what was different about you and the world? Well, immediately when I called out his name, all of the, the feelings of hopelessness and helplessness and, and fear, they just all subsided in that moment. And I had this overwhelming feeling of peace. And the communication started with him immediately. You know, no, there was no burning bush. There was no angel Gabriel. That communication started within. And he told me, he said, listen, you're going to be here for a while, but when you're done, you're going to go do great things. And I went to sleep that night. I slept like a baby for the first time in a year. And I woke up the next morning and I, had a, I literally had a new lease on life, no pun intended. But I knew I needed to do my part as well because I was going to be there for a while. Mm -hmm. So I began to, to really dig into the Word. I began to uh, read a lot of uh, self-development stuff, a lot of books, and even started uh, doing some teaching and training uh, when I was in prison with some of the other inmates, so it was pretty exciting. So you get out of prison, this is a tough transition for so many people, but you were able to get some support and chances, which not everyone has. You had a great girlfriend, you got a great job, you're starting to make money. So what's the problem, what happened? Well, you know, God opened some amazing doors and I walked through them and I started having success and uh, I got to a point where I started to lean onto my own understanding of things again. Mm -hmm. I started to feel like I was in control of my own destiny. And I got caught back up in the world. Uh, you know, having that success and things going well, I was not leaning on God as much as I should have been. 
And because I started to pull away, I wasn't reading the Word, I wasn't praying like I should be, I wasn't going to church, I wasn't involved in the church. I was slowly but surely just kind of pulling away and, and God's voice just got further and further and further away from me. And it wasn't long before it all came crashing down. Uh, in a matter of, of, of just a few months, I lost uh, my corporate job, six-figure year corporate job. I started going through a, a very heartbreaking divorce. Um, all of this happening at once, I began to lose everything. Mm -hmm. And that situation was more emotionally devastating for me than prison was. And I found myself there again, dark moment, at a crossroads in my life, on my knees, crying out. And the conversation was much different. It wasn't uh, take over my life, it was take me back. And immediately the answer I received was I never let you go, but it's time. It's time for you to get off the bench and get in the game. And this all relates back to when you were in prison, God saying to you, like, I have something big for you to do. Yes. You had a mentor as well in prison uh, sure. who confirmed that, who said, it wasn't even a Christian, but said, You're, you are meant for more than this. And right. so it was like God was speaking to you along the way, and then God finally says to you, it's time. What do you what do, you do at that point? Uh, it sent me on a mission to find out what my purpose was. And I started praying. I really started praying about it. I was actually walking through the mall one day, and a woman, come, a woman came by me and she walked by and she handed me a piece of paper. She made eye contact with me and handed me a piece of paper. And she just kept walking. And I opened up that piece of paper and on the inside of it, it said, be still and know that I am God. And it was a message that impacted me powerfully because I knew that I needed to take a step back and I really need to figure out what it was. So I started, I took, I took the message literally. So I got up every morning, had a cup of coffee, sat on the porch, I prayed, I listened, I prayed, I listened, just asking God to reveal to me what it was that he wanted me to go and do. The message to me was, you know, look back at your life. There's a common thread there. Your experiences, your professional, your personal, all of those experiences have, have clues in them that have gotten you ready to go and fulfill this purpose. And for me, as I look back at my life, in almost every situation I was in, prison, corporate America, owning my own businesses, I was speaking. So that was the one common thread that I saw. And um, uh, it just, it happened, it happened very, very quickly. Uh, it all just started to come, come together, yes. And part of that was, was finally being willing to share your story because even yes. once you kind of got your life back on track, you never really talked about your time in prison and what happened to you. Right. Who wants to talk about that, right? In a sense, it's behind you. Well, it's bigger than that because the, when I got out of prison, the, the, I believe the devil had convinced me that telling my story was going to hurt me. Uh, that it was going to prevent opportunity, it was going to close doors. And I know that a lot of people out there right now have been through some serious things in their life and they don't share those. They don't share how God brought those through them because they don't want people to know what they've done, what they've been through, etc. Uh, but it's, it's a, it was a moment for me when I did start to share my story. Not only did God prove that the devil was a liar, uh, because it, took, it had a complete opposite effect on my life than what the devil convinced me it was going to have. So, uh, you know, I've never had any professional training in speaking at all. I've never done any kind of Toastmasters programs. I've never done any professional speaking training. And I realized that very quickly that God had just gifted me with that. And that's what he was going to use. So tell me uh, what happens. You go to this high school, you're going to share, you're just starting to share your story now. You go to this high school, 500 students. What happens? You're, you're terrified, right? Because you don't oh, know Oh yeah, it was gonna... my first time speaking to the youth. And, and I got up and we were only expecting 100 kids to show up and 500 piled in that gymnasium. And I got up and I shared my story. And at the end, um, I offered them an opportunity to accept Christ. And 250 kids stood up in that gymnasium that day and made that decision. And for me, I don't know, it's a pretty special moment. You know, uh, Steve, there's a lot of people watching who feel like they're disqualified from having a relationship with God for doing anything in this world because of what's happened to them, because of the mistakes they've made. Uh, what would you say to those people who are in that very dark place? I would say that He loves us, that every day He looks at us and He loves us more than we could ever imagine and that he is going to take the pain if we let him. He'll take the pain, he'll take the hurt, he'll take our bad experiences, and that he will use them for good. He will use them to impact people's lives. Um, our stories 
All of our stories are just part of the much bigger story, which is his story. And uh, it's time for us, all as believers, to go share those stories. Mm -hmm.